A lot of people don't know, but uh, Bert's father, Gilbert, was the first employee at this research center before World War II. He was the first one that came, and so there's a lot of interesting stories, and I'm sure Bert might share a story or two with you, so I'm not going to give you any. But uh, his family has uh, an important heritage with the, both the industry as a whole and this center in particular. So, Bert, with that, I want to introduce you and thank you for what you're doing, and thank you for coming here today. Thank you. I told John when I was asked to speak, uh, had to deep, you know, dig deep in the barrel to get me. I probably might get your uh, face close to the mess. But uh, I'm, I'm proud to be here. I'm proud that uh, through uh, an organized effort through, from the industry with the academia and the scientists that we were able to breed these two grasses and come up with two grasses that hopefully will better serve us. You know, one of the things that's so important about uh, the limpo grasses is, you know, we, we've always wanted better varieties of grasses. And we've always had very good varieties of grasses over the years. Some of them have, have not persisted, others have. But, but what we've always wanted is a cool season grass, a perennial that would grow during the wintertime. And that's where these limpo grasses, especially south of I-4, fit in all of our management schemes. You know, we, we got Floralta now, and it's probably the best grass that we've ever had available to us that, uh, during the cool season, the three and a half months that we have to worry about most. With our long growing season, we can grow plenty of forages during the warm season, but it's the cool seasons that cost us the most money. And we can either harvest the grass, which a lot of folks do, or we can stockpile it. And I'm not going to say protein's cheap, but it's cheaper than baling hay. So we can set these grasses aside and use them, utilize them during the colder periods of, of the winter. And, and even as we've all seen, that have Peralta, and you get a, a pretty good frost, get a rain with the, that's associated with the front, and then get five, six, eight, ten warm days. Of, or out to will green back up and put some leaf back on. So that's one of the, the, the big the biggest factors in when we were thinking about this, you know, on one hand you've got big alt over here that could get that high and you can reach down there six inches and break the stalk and it was tender. So you know it had to be more palatable than for out there sitting over here. You reach down six inches and you can't always break you have to take the pocket knife out and cut it. So the those two schools of thought, thought, you know, there might be something in the middle. And through this whole process, I've been pretty closely associated with it as far as just being, being a witness to it. And it's been a very interesting process. Out of all of the siblings that were out there, there were some of it that looked like, you know, Bermuda grass. It wasn't that high. And just as thick. And then there were others that were bunch grasses. I mean, just the variety of, of grasses was very, very interesting to me. And I, I can't help but think that uh, you know, as we go about our days on our ranches, just looking around and just seeing what we do every day, not just the varieties of grass that are managing scheme. I'm reminded of a story of a preacher's wife that thought his, that she thought her husband was getting a little heavy. So she wanted him to start exercising, so she went and brought him, bought him a brand new bike, hoping that he would get on it every day and ride it. And he didn't much. One day he didn't have anything, other, anything else to do, so he got on the bike. So I go get on my bike, and take a ride around the neighborhood. Well, as he was riding around the neighborhood, he ran across this little boy grabbing a. I, I can't believe this. <laughs> <laughs> boy, that's a bike. Right, poor punch line too. But anyway. We were riding around the neighborhood and he said he comes up, up upon this little boy dragging a, a mower down the road. He said, boy, what you doing there? 
He says, I'm mowing yards. And he says, what are you mowing yards for? He says, well, I'm trying to earn enough money and I want a bicycle. The preacher got sank a little bit. He said, you know, I don't hardly ever ride this bike. I need a mower. So he said, I tell you what, let's just train. And the boy said, you sure? He said, yeah, it's a good mower. And the boy said, yeah, it's a good mower. He said, let's train. So they trained him. So about four days later, the boy's riding through the neighborhood here. He goes by the preacher's house. The preacher's got his lawnmower out in the front yard. And he, the preacher waved out, hey, come here. And uh, the boy said, yeah, what's up? He said, I thought you told me this was a good mower. And the boy said, it is a good mower. The preacher said, well, I've been pulling on this drink road for the last 10 minutes, and I can't get a drink. The boy said, oh, i got to tell you, you've got to cuss it before you drink. <laughs> And the preacher said, my goodness, son, I've been a preacher for 25 years. He said, I haven't said a cuss word in 25 years. As a matter of fact, I forgot how to cuss. The little boy said, you keep pulling on that crank rope, my bed come back to you. <laughs> That's how we are about what IFAS does for us and has done for us over the years. You look back, a classic example of what we used to be like is this center. As you read the signs coming in at the owner range cattle station. Well, that's what it was designed to be. You know, if we, if it was supposed to be like it like it was when it began, it'd all be flatwood. Wouldn't have any planted grass on there. They'd probably have, I don't know, maybe 125 cows on three or four thousand acres. They'd be burning woods for them in the springtime, they'd be putting them red cows and calves on the burns and leaving the, the other cattle uh, on the rough and they'd browse right there at you know 650, 700 pound cows weighing a 350 pound calf and getting a calf every other year. That was the scheme. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but that's what we owe to ICAS, to the ability to do the things that we do today. You know, we've got 1,150 pound cows, we 550 to 700 pound calves, and as much as we'd like to say we have a 90% calf crop statewide, you know, I'm sure it's probably close to 70. But it's all from what, what, what the research has been done through ICAS. And we all need to keep that in mind as, as we go about our days. And when it comes time to, to go to Tallahassee in March, show up because we usually lobby for IFAs, not that we don't ask for a whole lot. They gave us a, a funding request last year, but we asked that they don't get cut any 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 greater percentage than the rest of the, the, of the budgeting cuts. So I, I just would, would, I would, I would ask every one of you to consider that March quarterly meeting in Tallahassee and, and just understand how important it is for all of us to show up there with our hats on and and go from office to office and tell our story because we have a, a good story to tell and the other part I'd, I'd like to get just for a second just a little philosophical about when that number 10 grass was i was given the opportunity to to uh, name it and i, I thought about probably the, the greatest biggest influence the person that had the most influence in my life, and it was my dad. And you know what? He was part of that generation that grew up during the Depression. And they weren't worried about what kind of golf score they were going to shoot on Saturday. They didn't worry about how far the 7-Eleven was. So they'd go get an 18-pack of beer. They were worried about trying to survive. And work was the most important thing to them. And I think the further we get away from that great generation that saved us from fascism and brought the country back to prosperity, 
the farther we get away from that work ethic. I know that growing up, I worked every Saturday. We worked Sundays when we first got started on our own place after we left Duda's. And my mom was a very devout Christian woman. And after a fashion, she saw that we were able to get by without working on Sunday. So she asked my father not to work on Sunday. But every afternoon after school, I had three and a half hours to work of chores. I milked the cow until I was 17 years old. Every morning, every evening, I traded off to my brother. And I, by the time I was 12 years old, I was an integral part of a cow crew. And I wasn't out there texting, and I wasn't out there worried about what I was going to do or how hot it was. And I was just asked that we take that, just that thought home. And I mean, I, I wasn't as hard on my children as, I, as my dad was on us. But we can't lose that work ethic. And we've got to instill that in our children. We've got to give our children tasks that are tedious, even when it's hot. And they, have, they need to accomplish these tasks and then take pride in how they accomplish them. If we, if we don't do this as we go forward, we're going to lose that work ethic. And I know as, as family, farming, fam, families, that, that work ethic continues. But if you've got any influence on, on a child, or a form of slave, I would ask that you just keep that in mind. And, uh, and once again, I, I, feel, I, I feel good about being here. I feel honored to be here. I appreciate you asking me to come speak, John. And I, and I, I want to thank everybody that had anything to do with, that, with bringing these two grasses to bear because I really and truly do think that they'd possibly be a great place for them. Thank you.